much. I barely know what I'm doing, by the way, but um, I kind of know what I like hearing. And so I'll just try to manipulate it a little bit till it's like, that's me. <laughs> like when when the song starts, you're like, what'd what you say? What the hell is that? What, <laughs> what'd you say, squirt gun? Yeah, it sounds like a squirt gun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to Professional Musicians React. This is a very special episode for us because we get to have one of our favorite human beings on the planet, Lewis Cole, with us to talk about his own music, which is also some of our favorite music on the planet. Lewis is a multi-instrumentalist, a composer, half of the band Knower, and uh, also a wonderful solo artist with five albums. Lewis is one of my favorite artists in the world. We are psyched to have him here. Let's jump right in with Weird Part of the Night. One of my favorite Lewis songs. I've probably listened to this track a thousand times. Here we go. Weird Part of the Night, Lewis Cole. recordings of all time. It Listening. really is. I've listened to that yes. a thousand times. Okay, I have so many questions. <laughs> I have so many questions, Louis. Yo. Can we talk about synthesis and sound design? And you and I went deep on this for a couple years <laughs> together. Yeah, our dubstep era. Our dubstep era. And I think you learned a lot about sound design then, and so did I. Yeah. But it's funny because we we went in different directions with our synthesis and sound design, and you arrived at this very specific I would almost call it like Nintendo y, <laughs> yeah. like sound style. What What is it about your synths that make it sound like that? Well, uh, yeah, that's, I just started going simpler. I mean, because when we were like trying to make dubstep, we were listening to Skrillex all the time. We were trying to make like these synth sounds that sounded like Robocop eating a sandwich. But like then <laughs> I was like, you know what? I actually kind of really like the default setting when I open Massive. It's like, it sounds great. I, I barely know what I'm doing, by the way. but. Um, I kind of know what I like hearing. And so I'll just try to manipulate it a little bit till it's like, that's me, but also it's not too outside the scope of like classic, just regular synthesizer sounds. And all those synths in that recording, you played live, right? Including yeah. the bass parts. I gotta, I gotta tell you something, that riff, the dun, 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 that used to be the chords. At the end, the chords come in, and then I like was screwing around on my computer and I hit monophonic and I almost blew me out the window because it was supposed to be chords, right? And I hit monophonic and it just followed this melody within the chords. It was like, and I was like, you know, I was just like. <laughs> monophonic is when just one note is being heard. This is Molly Miller. She's a professor and doctorate in musical arts and she's in the house band on Listen to Your Heart on ABC. There's one main melody line versus multiple when there's uh, polyphonic sounds happening. Polyphonic, multiple at once. Monophonic, one note is being heard. It just blew me away. I was like, that's it. That's the song. So so you didn't write that melody. That melody happened by accident. Happened by accident. Yes. Yes. Which is a wonderful thing about synthesis. And when you build your own synths and you and you futz around with those parameters, you you sort of stumble on these wonderful little things. Mm -hmm. You know what's cool about that melody is it fulfills you you don't realize its function until it comes back like three fourths of the way yeah. through the song and you're like. Oh, that's the hook. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like when when the song starts, you're like, what do you hell say? Is that? <laughs> what do you say? Squirt gun? Yeah, it sounds like a squirt gun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and you're like, wait, is that the bass line? Yeah. And then yeah. and then the drums come in and they come in 
on a different part of the groove than you would have expected just hearing that line as context, right? Which yes. is already cool. Oh, you're right. I forgot about that because I've listened to the song a hundred thousand times, and so I know, you know where yeah. I know where it is in the bar. But the first couple times I heard it, when the drums came, I was like, "You're like, oh, that's oh. where one is." Yeah, yeah. And then you get that you keep bringing that melody back at various points of the song. It's like the Layla riff. You know what I mean? Except the Layla riff or a gajillion songs do that. Introduce a riff and then verse, pre-chorus, chorus, riff. And then the riff will come back at the outro and it's this hook that just keeps reappearing. You don't realize until like the fourth time it happens how hooky that is and that you just secretly plant that as like a hook. The next thing that stands out to me is just, <laughs> look at this waveform. <laughs> It's just yeah. It's a rectangle. A brick wall. It's a rectangle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. It's fucking smashed and saturated to oblivion. Yeah. How do you get it? How do you mix it like that? And I know we we were both listening to tons of dubstep. We were influenced oh, yeah. by a lot of those producers who just have square waveforms. How, are you mixing into a limiter? Are you mixing into ozone? Yes. How are you getting it to to hit like that and be was, that loud? I was mixing hard into ozone five. So everything, every mix choice I made was capped off with an Ozone 5 limiter. Yes. And that that was just, I, I have never stopped. Doing, I've done that on every mix. I, even ballads, I think I do that. So so you you open up a track and you put Ozone on Master Bus. Yeah, within you, like the first like, you know, day or two of working on it. Yeah. And then, and then just everything that happens thereafter is mixed through that Ozone mastering. And then you, and then... I guess when it comes to the end of the song, is there another step that people call mastering or is it pretty much done at that point? Oh, it's done. It's done. So you don't send it off to somebody who then treats it and does mastering. You finish it right there through the mixing stage. Yeah, exactly. You're, yeah. you're mixing and mastering at the same time. Correct. What yeah. preset on Ozone, Ozone 5? Number right. three. That's the one that you use, the limiter. Limiter three, right? Yeah, yeah, limiter three. Well, if it's Ozone five, it was, it was, yeah, it was IRC three, I think. Yes, it's called. IRC. Yeah. But I use Ozone eight now, which is killing. And I use usually the Ozone. I think it's Intelligent four or something four, like IRC four, whatever it is. And then you go to um, whatever the lowest, the bottom. I think it's transient. I think it's called transient. And then I never use the threshold slider. I never use volume gain from limiting. I just use that as a capper brick wall Interesting. exactly and so and i always put the, the the release time on zero as fast as possible that's just what i've liked it ends up being punchy and a little crunchy and loud enough okay so the other thing about this mix that i think is different than other than other mixes too is i and i say this in in the best possible way because i know you you like it sounding like this it's a it's got a trashy timbre to it <laughs> it's <laughs> it's like it's like um yeah for sure brittle and distorted and it's got a lo-fi quality to it even though it's super hi-fi music you're able to get it to sound rock and roll in that lo-fi kind of way and i know uh, you're going for that right oh, like dude it's so deliberate i'm yes. there for days being like it's not trashy enough it's too, <laughs> it's too trashy it's you know it's like because it's like oh, i can mix it clean i can definitely mix it clean it sucks i'm telling you and i have a version of that song weird part of the night where i just like blasted it with a distortion on the master bus and it's maybe my favorite version of that it's just like so crunch but i'm like i can't it's not as timeless i can't put this out some of your other records though are are released with totally saturated drums oh, sure. where they're just like on, on lewis cole one yeah. on the green record yeah i'm so, using i'm using the microphone that's somehow inside the keyboard of your macbook your laptop you know where you just like yeah, I used that, that microphone. I used to put the laptop on the floor next to the kick drum. You're like, this is fine, I guess. Wait, so I don't have a microphone, so I guess. With your laptop microphone, Yeah, and that's how you recorded drums. For, for certain songs on that first album, yeah. Like Window Shop, that's why, I mean, people would be like, yeah, no shit, it sounds horrible. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, for someone like me, it's like, I like it, you know, but. Um. I remember an epic argument when we were recording a song at your old house. Oh man, yeah. It was the three of us. Camcorder audio? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I remember that. And this was maybe the most heated argument I've seen between you guys because you loved the camcorder audio and you really wanted to record drums hi-fi. You were yeah. like, no, Lewis, we're not doing lo-fi drums. We're not doing, and you're like, come on, it sounds killing. It yeah. sounds so much better. Yes, I remember that. It was more grooving, but I actually agree with you now. I think that that was the right choice. Mm. 
thing. So yeah. I, and the I'm song never came out, so. Yeah. Yeah, apparently that was great, Jack. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, I have more questions for you. Because yeah. the, the other thing that I think is like immediately stands out to me, or at least towards the end of the song, the vocal performance. Mm. I mean, a lot of people think of you as a drummer, as a producer, as a sound designer. You're a fucking killing singer. Oh. Your vocals are awesome. You sound like Brian Wilson meets Michael Jackson. Meets Michael Jackson. Oh shit. And like <laughs> I mean, <laughs> see? So okay. Nah. You do the little <laughs> things throughout yeah. the whole song. Uh -huh. And are you imitating MJ? I mean, is that yeah. is that the that's the vibe that you're getting that from? Yeah, yeah, him and whoever he was imitating, James Brown, and yeah. you know, like yeah, that world. Those and what's but what's so unique the melodies about that. too sounds so MJ. Oh, me. dude, I mean, yeah, come on, I love Bad and um, Dangerous and Thriller. And, yeah, know, yeah, I was a huge influence on me for yeah. sure. And and but the thing is, m most people and what I love about your music is most people when you know when they sing like that. They're singing out and they got this huge thing. Like, ah, and yeah. there's like little mo it's like huge. But you're like indie rock guy. Ah. Yeah, yeah. It's like sure. indie rock with, ah, with a little bit of like My, micro groove emotions. In it. Yeah. And it's, yeah, for sure. It's such like I've never heard anybody do that before. It's so cool. And That's it, definitely where my voice sounds the best. When I start singing loud, it's like it's a different vibe. I mean, the end I was singing loud. And I the thing is I can't sing like that, but somehow it's like I need to for this song. So I just like I think I may have had a little alcohol. And then I was just in my garage, just screaming, and I could taste blood after I did that. Oh take. my god! <laughs> so I don't recommend any of that. Oh my god! I mean, that is one of the most violent uh, screams. Screams. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, out of any record, I, I love this scream. Yeah, that one. <laughs> oh my yeah. god! Blood curdling, literally. Yeah. Yeah, and it tastes then, a little metallic. It tastes like pennies after. You're actually that. doing this with those runs, right? Oh, yeah. You actually, can you demonstrate that for yeah, us? Yeah, this is going to be out of tune probably, but like, yeah! Yeah! yeah. In the weird part of the night. Did you, how long did you have to practice that to nail that and, and get that oh. working? All the time. You know what? That started as I was trying to do an impression of Jonah from Dirty Loops because that guy <laughs> sings like that. In, he doesn't That's need to do that. that. And so I was like, hey, you want to hear my impression of Jonah from Dirty Loops? And I'd yeah. like make my friends laugh. Like, uh, you know. And then I was like, wait a minute. I should use that in a song. And I did. And it's become like an iconic Lewis Cole thing, that vocal tap. Everybody. Yeah, I started, as we were listening, I started just writing down all of the unique to Lewis things about this recording. There's so, and then I realized it's the entire recording, but there's so many things that are you. The snap. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's like classic Lewis, just dry snap right <laughs> yeah, in the yeah, middle of the, sure. yeah. the mix. You're, I mean, we could do a, we could do a whole episode just on your harmonic sense. The way that you yes. write chords yes. is some of my favorite of all time. Yes. And oh, I've... Nice. I've known you for 20 years and I still have no idea. I've like watched you do it <laughs> yeah. a number of times. And the way that you come up with these like progressions that they don't make sense. You you have your own harmonic language. They're, they're these beautiful accidents that like when you slow them down or try to make sense of them, you can't figure them out, but How they work. Are you so writing those chords? Are you sitting at a piano and writing that out? Are you drawing notes in on MIDI and listening to how it sounds? If it's a big orchestral thing, I'll get really into the pencil tool and I'll like blow up the, the piano roll and I'll start like oh, voice leading, you know, and little inner melodies and stuff. But for something like that, I'm pretty sure I just knew that I wanted something that goes up chromatically in the bass, which I always like. I like chromatic movement, but especially upwards. Here's a major scale. I just played these notes, but there's other notes that are happening in between. The notes in between, when you connect it all, is a chromatic scale. So, you're just going up straight up in half step, so there's no space between the notes. It's easier to think about this maybe in reference to a piano. That's really easy to see. It's when you just go one note at a time, white and black keys, and don't stop. That's chromaticism. And then there's probably, I don't know for sure, I'm, my ears aren't the best, honestly, but there's probably a common tone in the top of the chord, the same yeah, note. I do that too. I always do common Dude, tones on top, I know. So can you show us, Jack, like chromatic in the left hand with the common tone? I mean, it's the, it's the classic Radiohead move. Yeah, exactly. Are you just 
just keep that note on top. Now just play just those bass notes yeah. and just the top note. And if you just put like weird, you can kind of do whatever you want because this makes sense. It's kind of yes. like we were talking about in the other episode. This makes sense and chromatic up makes sense. Yeah. So you can kind you of can like- You can get clustery exactly. and- yeah. yeah, it's cool to give yourself certain, certain guidelines. Yeah, yeah, that was nice. Yeah, thank you. That was nice. <laughs> Yeah. Transcribe that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, you can get that. You can do stuff in between when you have those those anchors on either end. Yeah, you, exactly. It's nice to give yourself guidelines sometimes. Otherwise, it's just an infinite blank canvas, and you're just like, "What? I need chords? What the hell?" It's like so, anything. I'm not like a you know fluid piano guy a lot of the times when writing. I just like that chord's good. Okay, let's try a next chord, and then I'll loop those two chords back and forth. Be like, these, these move together well, and then I'll go to the third and the fourth. Yeah. And then you end up learning it and playing it live exactly. when you actually record it. Learning it sucks, but yes. yes. That's why I can't play most of my songs because it's like learning them sucks later on. It's yeah. like, what did I do? <laughs> Are you recording in Ableton? Do you record in GarageBand? Where do you record? That was in the GarageBand. You uh, recorded that in GarageBand? Yes, but I mixed it in Pro Tools. Why did you record in GarageBand? I was just so comfortable with it. It's what it's what I had. It's all I had growing up. I, know I didn't ever have, like, I didn't pay for a program ever. It was free on my computer, so I was like... You guys are two of my favorite examples of doing the most with the, the least. Like you use the same like three pieces of gear <laughs> yeah. from like the time you were 14 until now, yeah. right? Which is like garage band, MIDI keyboard, yeah. you know, like a, a Taylor acoustic guitar, right. whatever. And similarly, you're not like, you like gear, like you can, you'll learn out about gear, but every piece of gear that you buy, you read the manual front to back and you learn it completely before moving on to the next plugin or the next, like forever, you had the native power pack plugins. You had L1. like five plugins that you used for like your first like five albums. Yeah. Yeah. Probably about 15 years. Yeah. yeah. This, I, I think I, I am in awe of you guys because of this, because I'm, I wish I was more that way. <laughs> but I think it's so cool and empowering to see how much you can do with so little. So before we move on to the next song, I have to ask you about the business of your music. You're living the freaking dream. Yeah. How is it working? Can you give us a sense, and you don't have to divulge the numbers and everything, but I'd be interested to hear how the business of your artistry works. I, I was not really making it until I put out this video called Bank Account. <laughs> Whatever it was, it worked. It was like a short song. I was trying to just like show people that I'd been practicing keyboard. And uh, the, the lyrics were, I'm too afraid to check my bank account, which was like based on real life. I put it out and then it's just like, I kind of had a career after that. And I don't know if that's even what you're asking, but it's like- Where does I, the money come from? Some touring sometimes. Okay. The thing is, is like that era, like 2017 and 18, well, we weren't really making a lot of money with the touring because we hadn't really figured out how to do it. So now at touring, yes, it would make more sense. But there is also just streaming and occasional video games or like a TV show or something, you know? Yeah. More video games, but. I feel like both of you, not to get too on the pedestal here, but both of you are such great examples of fearless pursuit of a vision. You guys have been grinding like for so, so, long i feel like yeah thank you man that's very nice of you i feel like that is a huge part of the reason why i'm making it uh however you want to define that but it's because during the inspiration dips i still find enjoyment and it's not always enjoyment i still just feel like i need to keep pushing and working on something yeah how can you give us a sense of how much you work what is what is your work schedule i mean in the in that period you know 2010 to 2017. Yeah, that was the big one. Like, what? T tell us about that period. Like, what were some of the... Yeah, like, yeah. 09 to 20, even, like, t 2020 up to then, I would say I was working, if I could, like, 14 hours a day. Just, like, playing drums, keyboards, writing chords, clicking the mouse, whatever, you know, just, like, trying to go for, like, 14 hours. Now it's more like six or something like that. Mm -hmm. Should we listen to Thundercat? I love Lewis Cole. Yeah. Sure. I love Lewis Cole. This so is this the is demo. a demo. This is the demo with Thundercat. Mm 
Yeah, there's that. <laughs> So wait, how does this work? Did you just send so that I sent voice memo to Thundercat? I sent him that. That's why I thought it'd be interesting to play that because like you can see the process. I sent him that, and then he wrote this really nice melody and the nice lyrics on on top of that, and the, all you, the vocal stacks and all that. Can you play that second beat when For it goes? Sure. Yeah. Okay, wait, I have an, oh I have an idea. Oh my god. Yeah. Can you isolate? I'm gonna point to things. Sure, let's and try. Can it. you just isolate what's happening? Yes, okay. I love this idea. This is such <laughs> a good idea. Uh, I can't do that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can. Wait, wait, you got, yeah. Sick. I, I don't understand how your brain works. I don't know how you can do such disparate patterns with such, like those, those patterns are so different and they don't overlap for like a bar or two. They don't like come back to zero. How does your brain, how do you process that? I don't understand. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I'll look at certain drummers and think the same thing, like Dan Weiss. When I look at him play, I'm just like, how does your brain work? <laughs> you know, but it's just like, it's patterns that ended up being comfortable for me. Like, for some reason, uh, you know. It's just basically that. Yeah. And then that makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. Just filling in the gaps between the back. But then yeah. what's the kick doing? And then that's where you kind of like, <gasps> <laughs> that's that's kind of where this helps, because then your right. legs can fall at the same time. And then you just then that's something where you'd practice it really slow, which is wrong. Okay, now let me try. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the actual recording. This is Thundercat. I love Lewis Cole. <laughs> Such a ratty <laughs> film. <laughs> that's you. Yeah. Based on real events, it makes Exxon offended. Yeah. That baseline is really nice. So he's playing bass? For like half of it, I think. Or yeah, I think on most of it. I don't remember after a while. But that part for sure. The second half of that is is like the most diatonic thing I've ever heard you write. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, that what, chromatic what happened, walk down. What in the happened bass. there? Yeah. Why, why why isn't it more weird? What happened? There? Yeah. <laughs> diatonic means everything is within one sort of key center, one family. So here I am going to play a scale, the G major scale. Sounds beautiful. I'll play chords that are also in that family, that diatonic family.
That one was not. That was not a diatonic chord. Sound it off. Did you guys, were you in the same location when you recorded that? Or did you just send shit back and forth and, and it was just over email, basically? I think, no, okay, the, the bass parts he actually had done before, like the, the really fancy, nice bass line for that verse before the solo and then also the solo. He had recorded at my house. And, uh, so he came over to your house? Yes. And recorded right there with yeah, you? Yeah, uh-huh. And then the vocals he did on his own. Because I remember I was in a hotel and he sent them to me. Did he send you the vocals when, once they were kind of finished? Or did he send you ideas for melodies? And did, did you give feedback? No, or he just, just like, he's just like, these are them. And I was like, yes, they are. <laughs> 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 they were perfect. Yeah, they are perfect. He likes to just go. And he doesn't want to sit there and figure it out. He wants to be recording while he's figuring it out. In fact, one time I played it for him and he was just like going and I was like, okay, that was a good warm up. He's like, you weren't recording. <laughs> you know, he was like disappointed you know, yeah. that I wasn't recording. And it's like, okay, I get it. That's like, you want to just have it be recording while you're figuring it and out. And he's like that good cool. that he can just, what comes out is just incredible. Oh, yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah. This is an aside, but I went to see Thundercat at the Will Turn and I was late for the show. And... I walked in, um, and the first thing I heard was from the stage, how many of you guys know Lewis Cole? <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> My roommate. Yeah. And, uh, and I just started filming. I was like, Lewis, yeah. he's talking about you. That's cool. And, and, uh, and he proceeded to tell like a five-minute story about how much he loved you and how you guys met. And then he played this song, and it was very, it was very cool. That's really Very nice. Cool experience. How did you guys meet and get to recording together? Well, it was um, the first time we met was through this Austin Peralta gig. The 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 great pianist who's no longer around, but he hired both me and Thundercat to play <laughs> at this gig, and uh, and then we just kind of played together, and it was just like massive amounts of energy. And I was like, this is amazing. We have to somehow you know stay in touch. And so we talked about like let's maybe try to record someday. Yeah, wow. and then it happened. And that was what year? 2012, October 2012. Oh, wow, that was a while ago. Just 10 years ago. Yeah. Your music, Louis, has a little bit of that Jacob Collier thing mm -hmm. where hot shit musicians listen to your stuff and freak out about it and love it. I remember John Mayer went on a tweet oh, yeah. storm a couple oh, years ago, yeah. just like, yeah. you have to go down the Lewis Cole rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. Why are they so pumped when they hear your music. I have my own answer, but I'd love to hear what you think it is. I don't really know how to answer that, but I am interested in all kinds of music, whether that's simple or complex. I guess that would be my answer. Yeah. What's your answer? I'd say like your harmony is unlike anyone else's in how out it is, but it also feels good. It's following your logic. Every part of these compositions and these recordings is is to your metric of perfection. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And you don't compromise. Everything about it is so you, and it just adds up to this, this thing that can be appreciated when you get into the weeds, but also just the raw energy and like the raw emotion. Your music to me is like the hard, the, the most hardcore punk rock and like the most weepingly beautiful choral stuff smashed together as both ends of the spectrum in a way that is just completely unique and nobody's ever heard before. So I think I think that's kind of what freaks people out is like how fresh it is and how it doesn't really follow any of the rules. You just kind of invented your own rules about what sounds good and what you're allowed to do. And I think people it connects with people. I, I mean, I appreciate the shit out of it. Man, thanks. Yeah. That's nice. We have a question here from yeah. our YouTube community from Bard Gunderson. What goes into Lewis Cole's production choices in drums or synth bass or arranging? Miking the drums in a certain way and tuning them a certain way for me really does it. How do you mic the drums? All right. I like, weird part of the night is two mics. And I love Lewis Cole with one mic. Weird part of the night was like overhead, like it looked like this. I don't know what that is, but it looked like that, it was like a small silver thing. And it was like around where my head is maybe a little more. 
And then I have one mic right here that like is usually on this side of the floor, Tom. Is that a, a Mark Ronson technique? Were you the one who told me that? No, he got that from me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you why I started doing that because I only had one mic for a while. It was this crap piece of shit, like USB. The uh, snowball mic? Worse. Okay. A Logitech mic that was like, it looks like a straw on a, it's by Logitech. I don't know, it's like a USB conference mic. It was like $19 at Office Max. And I was like, you know what? This is actually a, kind of an amazing sound. I like it. You know, I would like EQ it a certain way and I'd like distort it a little and, you know, make it punchy, com compress it or whatever I needed to do. But it's like, this is actually all I need. And uh, I'll have So it's it. pointed at the space in between. Yeah, it's pointed. Not... Like you want to kind of equally get the kick and the snare from something here. Okay. Uh, and that's just like, it just sounds like drums to me. It's like, that's like kind of the main mic. And then you add this in for twinkles and you add this in for like, if you need like ghost notes really like in your face, like all the little and snare are, notes. Are they all dynamic mics? Like use an SM57 for this? Yeah, dynamic mic here. Um, I want to try using a contact mic here. Um, and for twinkles, you don't use a condenser mic? No, I do. It, it, yeah. Oh, so, so that is a condenser. That's a condenser usually. Okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, we could talk about arranging. He's asking about arranging. Yeah. You've just done these or huge orchestra shows right. with the Metropole yes. Orchestra. And yeah. how many pieces was the orchestra that you were writing for? 50. 50. I think. 50 piece orchestra. What was that process like? Very fun. And I was just like, <laughs> I, I don't know. I was going through a weird time and I was like, I need to do this because it's an insane goal. And it's really, it was it was just insane to do that. Be like, it's, like I'm a, gonna... it's like deciding to do a triathlon or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank yeah. you for joining this us. Has, this has been Lewis Cole. Thank you so much for watching, for subscribing, for liking, for commenting. Uh, we'll be back with a new episode next week. <laughs>